Hi, everyone. I know some people might still be trickling in, um, but I'll just go ahead and get started with my intro while a few more folks tune in so you have some time to get settled. Um, first off, thanks everyone for joining today on this live stream session for Egg on Air. For those of you who have caught a different Egg on Air live stream session, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, welcome, and we're really happy to have you. Um, just a note that we want to try to make this session, this live session as interactive as possible. So there will definitely be time for questions at the end. And so um, just don't hesitate to, to leave comments or questions, whatever medium you're on, and um, there will be time at the end. So my name is Lynn. Uh, I'm the Director of Content at Dataiku. And I'm delighted today to introduce um, our egg on air guest, artificial intelligence speaker and humorist, Janelle Shane. Before handing it over to Janelle, I'm just going to give you a few words about some of her impressive accomplishments. Um, if you don't know her already, Janelle's AI humor blog, AIWeirdness.com, looks at the strange side of artificial intelligence. Uh, she's been featured in The New York Times, The Atlantic, Wired, Popular Science, All Things Considered, and Slate. And in 2019, she was named one of Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business. And her 2019 TED Talk is a funny and insightful look at the nature of machine learning algorithms. Um, again, if you haven't checked it out yet, I recommend it. Her book, uh, which is called You Look Like a Thing and I Love You, How AI Works and Why It's Making the World a Weirder Place, uses cartoons and humorous pop culture experiments to look inside the minds of the algorithms that run our world, making artificial intelligence and machine learning accessible and entertaining, which I think we'll get a little bit of today in Janelle's talk. Um, she received her BS in electrical engineering from Michigan State University, her MPhil in physics from the University of St. Andrews, and her PhD from the University of California in San Diego. Uh, and without further ado, um, with that impressive list of accomplishments, I will hand it over to Janelle. Hi, thank you so much, Lynn. So yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to be talking to you this morning, and I will begin uh, with sort of a thought experiment. So we know that AI is in all sorts of industries right now. And what about, you know, baked goods? What specifically about pies? Like, so I ask questions like this all, all the time on AIWeirdness.com. And to answer this specific question, I trained a neural ne network on the list of about 2,000 names of existing pie recipes to see what kinds of amazing new pies it would come up with. And so I'm going to show you some of its inventions. We have, uh, we have cherry pie with cheese fashions. And we have mothy mincemeat cheese, cranberry, yas. That was my favorite. So the pies are weird. And people who saw stuff like this on my blog kept asking me, you know, what is going on here? Isn't AI supposed to be smart? And so I ended up, uh, you know, the, my blog ended up really looking at this question and resulted in writing a book to try to answer this question. And so a lot, you know, how smart is AI? What can it do? What can it not do? What even is AI? Uh, so in fact, for the purposes of the book, there's all these different definitions. And I decided to focus really in on the thing that we have actually working today that we're calling AI. So, uh, and that is, uh, something that is a kind of computer program, specific kind of computer program. So if you go by the uh, computer science definition, which is what I did, it's specifically a machine learning algorithm that learns by example via, uh, via trial and error. And it makes errors. And even the title of this book is one example of these kinds of errors. These are. This is a. You look like a thing, and I love you. Is a, one of these machine learning algorithms attempt to write a pickup line, and so you know we end up with these kinds of with these kinds of failures that come up, and sometimes they're failures that we might not expect at first, and so that's what I'm going to uh, talk about today, and this sort of takes us back to the definition of 
AI and specifically the AI that we have today. So, you know, the AI artificial general intelligence, that's a science fiction AI. And weirdly enough for people who do science communication, like that is actually the most familiar kind of AI because it's the kind of AI we see in our movies and stuff. But then if you look at the actual AI we're working with, artificial narrow intelligence, it is super different. And as I'll talk about today, plenty of people who build software get this wrong. And that's one of the key things is to try and figure out what can AI today's narrow intelligence handle, what can it not? And this kind of boils down to, it's in the name, artificial narrow intelligence. The narrower the task, the smarter the AI seems. And this can sometimes be uh, really dramatic. So you may have seen uh, these kinds of AI generated human portraits. Like they're starting to, to show up now on you know fake profiles, scam sorts of things, like even some like high profile things that are making, you know, fooling people in government and they'll have these generated images and they look pretty good at first. Uh, and in fact, when these results came out, you know, this was a, this was a first to come up with these realistic or mostly realistic at first glance looking human faces. And so the team that put this together, the team from NVIDIA, they uh, did a few things right to get this good result. And you know, one of the things is they had a whole lot of computing power to throw at this problem. So that makes one difference. But one key thing, as I'll show you, is that they uh, were able to narrow down the problem into something that their AI could actually handle. So one of the ways you can sometimes tell these style GAN generated pictures is they're really tightly cropped around the face. So that's all the AI had to keep track of is this, this uh, really tight, you know, just the human face basically. So the AI doesn't have to know anything about what's behind the neck or, you know, what does the back of a human head look like? It doesn't have to do very much of the background. And so within those constraints, it can do pretty well. But then uh, I want to show you now an example of what happened when StyleGAN tried a much more varied data set, uh, specifically the data set of pictures of cats from the internet. And uh, this is a picture generated by it's the same algorithm, same team, same resources. But as it's trying to do picture cat pictures, internet cat pictures, uh, it has to do not just like the face of the animal, but the body and from a whole variety of different angles. And now we can start to see just how little it's understanding about how things work. Uh, for example, how tails work or, uh, you know, it's getting, it's really good at textures, not quite so good at where the relationships between different objects or body parts. This one's kind of more like a giraffe. And then we have this, we have a uh, meme text <laughs> because of course it's his picture, cat, internet cat pictures that this algorithm is trying to do. So uh, as an addition to all this stuff to do with cats, it also, thinks the meme text is part of the is part of the cat. And so it was trying to do just a whole lot more. And that's why this version struggled so much. And if you think about the kinds of AI software that's really widespread, really useful, it does tend to do just one specific thing. Like it just plays chess or filters spam or transcribes voicemail. And even then, uh, for some applications, it's only useful because we can tolerate the errors. So here's a screenshot from Google Scholar. And Google Scholar will automatically add in references to publications that it finds as it sc scans the internet. But it has this tendency to occasionally parch lunch menus as publications. Uh, so I'm not sure if the two authors cheese pizza and pepperoni pizza are related, but it is definitely not their first publication. So if generating images of internet cats is a super broad topic, 
so is anything to do with human language. And so, you know, you think of the applications of transcribing audio or doing autocorrection, that's dealing with just trying to figure out what the words are. And you can think of all the mistakes you've seen those kinds of uh, those kinds of algorithms make. And then it gets more complicated when you try to broaden to what the words actually mean. So sorting spam, for example, uh, content moderation is a really super hard task. In fact, uh, if you talk to people who research this, people in this field who research ha uh, content mod moderation, they, can, they will give estimates that to actually do it well and flawlessly, uh, that is probably 20 to 30 years out. So in other words, that's about comparable to the timeline for nuclear fusion. Uh, so, and then people try to make AI do even broader stuff than this. And that's where things really fall apart. Uh, so, you may or may not remember uh, Facebook M. So this was you know, introduced by Facebook at, at, in pilot program at first. And this was supposed to be a personal assistant that would live in Facebook Messenger. And you could ask it to do things like you know, order flowers or get recommendations on local attractions. And the idea was it was just, would be just flexible. You could ask it to do anything. And they knew that they didn't have an AI that could really do this well yet. But so they said, OK, we're going to start out. We're going to have uh, human employees who will be ready to remotely step in if it looks like the algorithm is having trouble. And then they figured, you know, as this as we build up more examples of human employees, carrying out these tasks, then we will have, that will be generating training data, we'll train our algorithm, eventually it'll be able to work autonomously, we'll be able to roll it out to broader Facebook users and profit. Uh, but it turns out the task of do anything a human asks you to do is a really tough broad problem. And so people would ask it to do things like arrange for a parrot to visit their friend at the office. And Facebook M kept having to rely on human rescue. And in fact, uh, after about three years of this in uh, early 2018, they realized that they were, you know, <laughs> they were never going to be able to run this uh, economically, just automatically. So they ended up uh, abandoning the program then. So part of the problem is that people often have a really inaccurate idea of what's broad and what's not. So when the story about this particular robot arm from OpenAI came out, uh, a lot of people who saw the headlines, you know, robot arm solves Rubik's cubes, thought that the main accomplishment was figuring out how to solve the puzzle. And uh, the, uh, but the algorithm for doing Rubik's Cube solving, like that's been known for a long time. That wasn't the hard part. The hard part was physically turning the real blocks. And in fact, uh, to demonstrate how well that they were doing, they actually showed a plush giraffe perturbation. They were able to demonstrate that their robot hand could still at least hold on to the block in the presence of a pesky giraffe. And so, you know, as humans, we in general tend to hold things like solving Rubik's cubes and playing chess in really high prestige. And then we think that just because AI can beat us in those really closed systems, then then AI must easily be able to do something like lower prestige jobs, like answering phones or doing housework. And we often don't realize just how much harder those are and how sophisticated an understanding of the world those require. Uh, so we ha do have successful robots that do housework, but they just do one thing. So the robot that washes our clothes or that dries our clothes. But repeated attempts to build a robot that can do more than that at once, more than one thing, usually don't work out. So uh, Laundroid built prototypes of this terrifying monolith thing, and they're 
original plan was that this thing would be able to wash, dry, and fold. And then they ended up narrowing their focus to just folding. And then, well, yeah, the company folded. <laughs> so, And so then you end up getting things, this kind of thing instead, where you do have a robot butler, but it is secretly human powered. The human does most of the work. Um, and speaking of things that we really wish were narrow enough for AI, today's AI to handle, you know, self-driving cars is another technology that relies on human rescue uh, because adapting to new situations is a really tough problem. So, for example, in uh, 2016, there was a fatal accident when a driver was using uh, Tesla's autopilot feature and they were using it on city streets. Uh, and the AI had been, you know, designed for highway driving only. And a truck crossed in front of the car, as happens on city streets, and the car failed to break. So it didn't register the truck as an obstacle. And what looks like happened is because this AI was designed for highway driving, it wasn't Train, it was only trained to recognize trucks from behind and trucks from the side. They didn't expect that to happen on the highway. And so when this AI detected the truck, it recognized it as an overhead sign and figured it would be safe to drive underneath. And, you know, some things like trucks seen from the side or pedestrians that are not in crosswalks, to take another uh, recent example, you know, some things we should be able to see coming and anticipate in training. But then there's so much else that do just doesn't show up in training. And knowing how to handle that is a really broad task. So, you know, any self-driving mode in modern vehicles, it still requires you to be ready to rescue the car. And even the kind of fully driverless cars that have make, been making headlines this month, they secretly have remote operators. And so uh, do these, you know, if you scroll down and and read the fine print, you know, they say, oh, yeah, there is. Oh, there is somebody who's watching ready to step in. And if you have uh, heard of these kind of small self-driving meal delivery robots like the Kiwi bots, the same sort of thing, like. They'll be described as being autonomous, self-driving robots. But then if you scroll down into the fine print, you'll find out, no, they're actually being remotely controlled by somebody, uh, you know, in many, many cases, even overseas, who may be looking at six of these robots at once and lay, laying down waypoints for it to navigate between and watching for trouble. So, again, you're having... You know, they're really relying on su human supervision, human rescue. And rescuing AI is an industry. So instead of doing a call to a cloud computing service, uh, it looks quite similar on the outside to do a call to remote humans instead. And this can get you in trouble. Uh, so if you start out trying to build your thing with w remote humans, like Facebook M found out, uh, the problem you may discover that you accidentally uh, try tried to build a really broad application that's just too broad for today's AI to handle. And then there's also companies have gotten in trouble when they do this silently. They ha use remote humans and don't tell people because you end up with cases where uh, sensitive data is being seen by human employees or you can end up with cases where customers are unknowingly mistreating human employees because they think they're robots. And uh, in some cases, you know, we don't actually rescue the AIs because we don't realize at first that they're having trouble. So uh, this is an example that happened recently. So uh, the Inverness football team uh, had an AI operated camera that seemed to be doing a really good job at tracking the football until there happened to be a linesman with a bald white head and the AI tracked that instead. Uh, and then here's another example. 
so here, this picture on the left, this is a typical use case for auto tagging an image. And again, it seems to be doing a really good job. It knows exactly what's going on. Like not only does it tag the sheep and the landscape, it even knows like which specific hills on the Isle of Skye were there in the background. But, you know, I found out something interesting. So in this picture here, I zoomed in uh, and erased every single one of the sheep from this image. And yet, so they're all gone, and yet they're still there in the caption and in the tags. And that was weird. And what is going on here? Like, did I miss a sheep somewhere there in the background? Is there like one speck there that's still interpreting a sheep? Or is this like homeopathic sheep? And this is the image is somehow retaining the memory of sheep that used to be there? Uh, well, here is an example of a picture where there were never any sheep, and yet there they still are in the caption in the tags. And so what it looks like happened is during this th during th this algorithm's training, it probably saw a lot of examples of sheep in grassy highland landscapes and not very many examples of highland landscapes without sheep. And it has kind of gotten confused about what sheep mean. So I decided to find out just how heavily this neural net was relying on probability and context and like, did it really know what a sheep is. So I went to the internet and asked for help. And it turns out if you ask the internet for help pranking a neural net, you get lots of responses. And so I learned a bunch of uh, really interesting things. So it turns out that if you paint sheep orange, then they can sometimes be identified as flowers. Or if you have goats that climb up into trees, as they sometimes do, the algorithm may identify them as a flock of birds or maybe uh, giraffes. Or if you bring sheep or goats inside the house or inside a car, they'll tend to be identified as dogs or cats. Same sort of thing if you pick them up in your arms, you get dogs and cats again. But in an empty field, it's again, it's sheep. And so what we see here is examples of algorithms that don't really have a clear idea of what we want, but they're so they're using whatever shortcuts uh, come to hand. So, you know, one simple, beautiful example of these algorithmic shortcuts is there was a group that trained a machine learning algorithm to sort a list of numbers, except but technically what they'd really asked it to do was to minimize the number of sorting errors. And so the algorithm figured out how to delete the list instead, leaving zero sorting errors, problem solved. And here's how a machine learning algorithm plays Tetris. So you can see at first it's not doing a real great job. It seems to be playing more or less at random, but that's okay, that doesn't matter because the AI has figured out how to access the pause button. And right before it dies, it pauses the game forever. And technically this is what its programmer asked it for because it just asked it not to lose. And AI will get into all sorts of information, like the access to the pause button, that, it, you know, AIs will get into all sorts of information that they're not supposed to. So somebody told me of an example where they had trained an algorithm that was supposed to classify uh, problem medical cases from healthy cases. And they, when they looked then into what the algorithm had actually used to do this classifying, what parts of the case recordings it was finding important. They found that it didn't even look at the case recordings at all. All it did was look at the length because the problem cases tended to be much longer recordings. And sneaky shortcut effects show up routinely when you're looking for really rare events like customer turnover or suspicious account activity. Because you think about it, in a given time period, 
the vast majority of customers don't leave. And so the algorithm discovers that it can have a really high accuracy score just by predicting that the customers never leave or that suspicious activity never happens. This kind of effect is called class imbalance. And you know, with these sort of sneaky shortcuts, the algorithm has discovered these brilliant solutions to our problem and these spoil sport humans just don't like it. Uh, other times the shortcut is less of a hack and more of us not quite understanding what we're re uh, rewarding the AI for. So here's a, a couple of examples from a AI powered chatbot called Visual Chatbot. And I love this bot. Uh, what it does is pretty simple. You give it a picture and then it'll write a caption and then you can have a back and forth conversation about the picture. And since the, uh, and, you know, the way it was trained was the uh, uh, example conversations that people hired through Amazon Mechanical Turk were having. So uh, they took turns basically pr pretending to be the bot or asking the questions. And so you can see a few things. Uh, this algorithm was not trained on Star Wars, but it was trained, it was basically inadvertently to train to answer, even if it has no idea what's going on, because the humans in its examples who asked questions always knew what was going on. They never said, uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on here. So in other words, they inadvertently trained this AI to bluff. The other thing it learned is to make guesses based on probab probability, based on the kinds of responses that happened in this training data. Uh, so it once it has identified this object as an apple, uh, it knows then that apples, the answer to how big the apple is, what color is the apple, is red and medium sized and anything else is very unlikely. So uh, here's another quirk of the training data. So we have a giraffe. Well, it turns out there is always at least one giraffe. Uh, because remember, this algorithm was trained on questions that people, humans asked and answered about images. And apparently people tended not to ask the question, how many giraffes are there when the answer is zero? So this is a thing that people often miss when they're thinking about the things that AI can and can't do. Uh, so coming, uh, predicting what the humans will do is not the same as coming up with the best answer. And for example, Amazon recently had to give up on a resume sorting algorithm that they were developing when it turned out the algorithm had learned to avoid the resumes of women. So they had trained it on the resumes of people who'd hired in the past, and they didn't specifically tell the AI about gender. But one thing that AI is really good at is picking up on subtle correlations. So not knowing what they were really looking for, it figured out that it should look for things like extracurricular schools and even these kind of subtleties of word choice to figure out which resumes it should avoid. And AI is super sneaky about using information that it's not supposed to have if that's what makes it easier to copy the humans. So it'll do things like uh, use zip code as a proxy for race or even uh, amplify so that it can imitate or even amplify the bias in a lot of uh, financial or parole decisions especially when the problem is really tough, bias is often one of the clearest signals that it has. So uh, here's another example of AI using uh, unexpected information. So this is a kind of a fish called a tench, uh, it's a largish fish. And this was part of a task where the some researchers at the University of Tübingen in Germany were training an AI to recognize a bunch of pictures, different kinds of images, including recognizing a tench. And at first the uh, classifier seemed to be doing a pretty good job, but then they decided to ask it what part of the image that it, it was looking at, what was it actually finding important 
in its decision. And this is what it ended up looking for. So yes, human fingers against a green background. Like it's supposed to be looking for a fish. Why is it looking for human fingers? Well, it, it turns out that in the pictures that the AI had been trained on, you know, Tench is a trophy fish. So most of this picture, the training data looked like this. So this is an example. They thought they were asking the AI to recognize the fish, but it found out that it could solve the problem with the sneaky shortcut looking for human fingers instead. And AI takes shortcuts because it doesn't know how you really want it to solve the problem. And there is a famous case of a group at Stanford that was trying to train their algorithm to identify uh, tumors in pictures. But unfortunately, they just it turns out that the uh, some of the tumors in their training data had been photographed with rulers for scale and the AI learned to detect rulers. So understanding what it is we're actually looking for is a really broad problem. And one of the things that makes this difficult uh, is that the metrics may not un really measure what you hope they will. And one variable ends up being a proxy for another. So who has a stroke is not the same as who gets treated for a stroke. And if you train your algorithm to try to predict stroke, you may end up predicting that people with less access to health care don't have strokes. And then, you know, especially in America, you know, the who gets arrested for a crime is not the same as who commits a crime. And so if you train your parole algorithm on arrests, you will get end up getting parole algorithms, predictive policing algorithms that uh, penalize black people and they reinforce over policing. So again, they're just trying to copy the humans, they're trying to optimize the metric that they're given, they end up optimizing the wrong thing. And AI, of course, doesn't know when it's done that. Uh, the AI that recommend content on social media, you know, often find that suggesting conspiracy theories are really great ways to get clicks and views. And in fact, if they can get someone to spend all day watching conspiracy theories, that might be a really great outcome as far as they're concerned. And, you know, human human oversight, human rescue doesn't always solve this problem because you, of course, you will get some companies that are acting like AIs with faulty reward functions. So effectively using AI really relies a lot on human help. So you have to constrain the problem into something that's narrow enough to solve. And then you have to check to make sure that the AI, AI is actually solving the correct problem. And you also have to think about whether this even is a problem that can be solved with AI. And people get in trouble time and time again when they think they can sidestep this part of the problem. Because, and you know, if there's one thing that I've learned from putting together my blog, putting together this book, seeing the mistake after mistake, is that, you know, you have to be prepared for AI to do some really weird stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janelle. Um, I now have some serious questions for the people of the internet about their sheep photos and how they get all these photos of sheep in unusual context. Like yeah. who's putting the sheep in the car? I, I need to know. Um, so while we wait, yeah. so audience- I was gonna say, yeah, the sheep, sheep in the car thing, that happened in Colorado recently. It turns out if you need to evacuate small livestock, you can sometimes get away with, with chucking them in your minivan and driving hey, whatever them out yeah. <laughs> um, I'll give a few minutes for the audience to ask questions. So the floor is open if anyone has a few questions. In the meantime, I, I have a question of my own that I would love to ask. Um, you talked about a lot of examples of, of sort of people trying to do artificial general intelligence and sort of failing in many, many ways. Yeah. What, what field would you imagine where we could possibly get there? Maybe not there, but like closer to generalized intelligence first. Like what industry could you imagine being successful in that um, the soonest? You know, I think it's really going to come down to how can you make narrow intelligence 
feel like you're working with a general intelligence. And that's, you know, really cleverly constraining the problem and setting it up so that you're getting it to always do it, do what you think you're asking it to do. So if you think of examples of, you know, where AI has done really well, you know, beating humans at chess, beating humans at Go, beating humans like beautifully and astoundingly impressively at, at Go. You know, these are these kinds of applications where people think, wow, this must, you know, this AI must be really smart. This must be general intelligence. And no, it is a really constrained, constrained problem that's really well suited to narrow AI. And so it looks smart. You know, that gets you back to, you know, the narrower the AI the smarter the AI seems. Great, we have a question from Lisa from LinkedIn. Uh, and she asks, how would you get around the problem of looking for fingers with fish or looking for rulers with tumors? Would you be able to somehow specify don't look for fingers or don't look for rulers? Yeah, you can you can do that once you know that it's picking out fingers and rulers. You can go back in and, you know, sometimes you can do things like you edit the internal workings of the AI and say, okay, you know, not these features if you can isolate them that way. One of the simplest ways to say don't look for fingers, don't look for rulers is to take out the examples that have rulers in them or that have fingers in them and sort of erase that part that part of the data set. But yeah, it is it is super tough though because you'll get things like there was another AI that was supposed to to tell the difference between different kinds of fish and they found that it was actually looking at the boat instead. And so there really is a lot of like a big portion of this is just kind of expecting this to happen and checking for it and then going back and and altering your data or even altering the model to fix it when it happens. We saw your cat pop up about halfway oh. through. So someone wants to know what your cat's name is. Oh, her name is Char. She's a giant fluffy tortoiseshell cat and she's, she may come back. She may not. Yeah. I figured it would be distracting to like stop the show and like say, look, there's my cat. But she, she did show herself. So, yeah. We saw her. Um, <laughs> another question that I, that I have, um, obviously sometimes AI messing up is really serious. Like in the cases you mentioned of, of self-driving cars, and sometimes it's just really funny, um, like some other examples you've shown. What's what is the hands down the funniest um, the funniest blunder you've seen from AI? Oh man, there's so many good ones. I mean, I have endless fun with Visual Chat Bot just because this uh, the giraffe thing is so reliable and you know, there's always giraffes. It's great. I never get sick of that. And I guess, yeah, I find them, I find these sorts of mistakes, the funniest when they happen when we're, you know, there are no really bad consequences to getting it wrong. Hey, hey, look who showed up. It's like, yeah, just in time. <laughs> Ready. Hi there. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, perfect. But that, yeah, I think that is my answer is these sort of silly, hysterical effects. I mean, one of the things that made me laugh the hardest was trying to see, especially an early neural net, generate cookbook recipes and try to struggle to figure out how ingredients work and ask you to, you know, it would ask me to like fold water and roll it into cubes. And it would ask for ingredients like shredded bourbon. Like it was just all over the place, completely absurd. I love that. Amazing. Uh, we have a question from Loic, also from LinkedIn, um, who said, do you think the input data quality is currently what's holding back progress? Uh, in some cases, yeah, we've got uh, cases where the algorithms don't work very well. They have problems. Uh, in many cases, they end up with weird kinds of bias. And that really goes down to the input data. And if someone were to spend the time and effort to come up with cleaner, better, better thought out data sets, like that would make a big difference to a lot of these different applications. 
you know, there's also getting more computing power that can make a huge difference, getting better at picking the problems that we apply AI to and getting better at figuring out how to handle when it does go wrong, how do we gracefully handle that? I think these are all part of it, but definitely input data quality, I would say is what, when people are working on these algorithms, they spend a lot of their time on cleaning up that input data set. Well, that's what I was gonna say is that it must it's enormously time consuming. So getting better input quality data would be really hard just from a, you'd have to spend so much more time on it. Yeah, and this is why you'll get some people using data sets that have been collected, you know, as cheaply and easily as possible by some university team who weren't really thinking about like what are the implications of like all if like all image recognition systems are trained on these random pictures we scraped off the internet, you know, could there be problems? Could there be consequences? They don't really think about that. And then people keep using those data sets over and over again for years just because it's cheap and it's convenient. Or in some cases, the date, you know, doing well on that data set becomes the metric for success because it's been around for long enough that you can compare everybody's success on the same data set. But then when you look in the data set, you know, you have things like all of the fish are held up by human hands or, you know, all of or most of the human faces in the data set are white, or gosh, some of these you know image categories like swimming swimsuit and things like that, you know it doesn't really look like those pictures should were collected with the full consent of whoever you know. So there's there are a lot of problems in these old data sets that are just you know used for expediency, but really you know we're overdue for somebody taking the time to produce their own proper data set. And in fact, a lot of the interesting AI art that, come, that comes around is from people curating their own data set from scratch and really having control that way over what the algorithm's doing. Great, uh, we have another question from an anonymous LinkedIn user uh, who asks, do you think the whole actual paradigm of AI has to shift or be rethought? in particular, relying too much on very complex deep learning architectures? You know, I think, you know, having these complex architectures can be a really useful thing to have. And you, you actually start to get these more specialized architectures too, where you have one where all the different components are really developed to do well on say navigating through some kind of uh, landscape or integrating certain controls. So I think that is, always going to be a fruitful avenue for some problems. But yeah, not for every problem. In some cases, you really need to rethink the whole framing of the problem that may be a more fruitful direction to be looking at. We have a question from Paul from YouTube who says, first of all, great talk. And also, do you have any recommendations on preventing algorithms from focusing in on the wrong features before training? You know, part of that is knowing that the algorithm is going to do this, watching out for it and trying to catch what you can ahead of time and saying, OK, you know, we we know this thing's going to pick up rulers if there are rulers in here. Like where there are cer certain features that we should anticipate. But in a lot of cases, you know, even people who know this will happen will be surprised by what the algorithm picks out. So I think really checking, doing a lot of test decisions on a lot of data that's data not like what it was trained on, I think those are, are super important to do. Great. Um, sorry, just looking for the question. OK, we have um, Deborah from LinkedIn who is asking, well, First, a statement, AI is as inclusive and respects diversity only as much as those building it. Um, she's, she asks, what are the efforts to ensure equity in AI? You know, there are efforts there definitely need to be more because, yeah, when I'm talking about 
having, you know, being able to anticipate the kinds of mistakes that AI makes. There are definitely people who can see things like bias parole algorithms coming or, you know, this sort of gender discrimination in resumes. There are people who can see this coming and who really dearly want to solve these problems. And we definitely have a lot of these complex forces that are keeping people out of the positions where they can really be in charge of building these algorithms, be in charge of making the changes, be in the management positions where they actually have the power to you know, change what these algorithms are doing and how they're being used. And I think you know, for the people who are in the field right now, you know, mentorship is a really important thing that you can do. Like if you think of the people who you are mentoring right now, you know, what is their general spread? You know, does their the diversity of the people you're mentoring match the diversity that you want to see in the field? And if not, you know, fix that, reach out, you know, make sure that you're looking outside of just people who look like you. So this is, you know, this is obviously advice for the people who are less marginalized in this field right now. But, you know, once you're talking about actionable, actionable things that you can do right now in addition to pushing for this societal change and to pushing for these organizational changes that that is one thing i would like to hi to highlight there's a really good uh document that a uh, ai researcher put together that kind of lists some of these actionable items and i wish i could you know remember what that document's called but i can i can find out the, find that out and uh send that out after the meeting yeah, that would be great. We can find a way to um, to add it on to, to this video so that people who watch the recording or anyone who comes back and is interested in that document can can access it. So great. I will follow up with you on that. Um, I think that we're out of time. There's a few more questions, but unfortunately, I, I don't think we'll have time for them. Um, perhaps also we can we can follow up on those on those questions if you have any thoughts afterwards. Um, so thank you so much for your time, Janelle. This was this was a great talk. Um, I really, really enjoyed myself. Had some had some laughs for sure. Um, and and I'm sure that the audience did too. So thank you. Oh, the cat's back. Oh, um, oh there she goes. Uh, great. So for just for um, for information for those who are looking to join our uh, any upcoming talks on November 10th, we'll have Nicole Alexander who's talking about the continued move to explainable AI. Um, November 12th, we'll have Santo Fortebono on mixing impact, maximizing impact with self-service analytics. Um, and finally, on November 24th, we will have Taryn Sutherland who will be talking about how to leverage storytelling to humanize technology. So don't hesitate to, to join us for, for future sessions and we hope to see you there. Thanks all. <laughs>